Hello, and welcome to Tools of the Trade, a series where we talk about the tools used in high seas piracy as it relates to blood and plunder. I'm Dan. And I'm Guy. And today, we are talking about muskets. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> so muskets are one of the most prolific firearms that you'll see in Blood and Plunder. Uh, almost all the models out there have a musket. And the ones that don't are notable just because they don't have a musket. Exactly. Muskets kind of defined the whole buccaneer era that the game is starting out in. But you also notice as you look around that Blood and Plunder uses a lot of different musket types. They'll say, here's a matchlock musket, here's a, here's a firelock musket, here's a buccaneer gun, and even the rare heavy matchlock. Because often, as with, as with most of the games that Firelock makes, history relates directly to the actual gameplay. So for starters, to rip a big band-aid off, uh, all of the muskets that Blood and Plunder uses in the game are actually Firelock muskets. Firelock is a term for a musket that has a locking me mechanism that locks fire or the firing of something so you can pull a trigger and have the fire slam down. That is a matchlock and a flintlock, which are the two types of firearm that uh, really most models have. Is either they're using a match cord or they're using flint and steel to produce fire. What makes it a fire lock is the actual mechanism of the firearm. So where a what we would call an arquebus, which we'll get into, most of those older guns is just a simple lever like a crossbow. You pull up on the lever and it lowers the smoldering match in the pan, nothing locks back. It just is a little spring inside that lowers it and puts it back up. What the lock does, you can actually pull back the hammer, is what we'll call it for all intents and purposes, it actually locks into place. A lot of these fire locks have the very first safety mechanisms because there was a half cock when you were loading, and then you'd pull it back again for a full cock, which is, you know, your firing position. So the lock is actually the locking mechanism which was a huge leap forward from a basic lever to something you can lock back and then take aim with. Now, going through the different types of guns that are in the game for, for the muskets, the Arvacus uh, actually shows up as, as the heavy matchlock on, in a lot of the Spanish troops. And that's because the Spanish Empire was huge and wasn't able to arm their whole empire now, when we're talking powder and shot firearms, most people think, oh, it is black powder and a musket ball. Musket is mus musket. That is not typically the case. The arquebus was super obsolete because it was big. It was heavy to lug around. The actual bore of the barrel or the diameter was so big because it was meant for intense rate of fire and just firing as fast as you can that its accuracy was very limited, even if you wanted to patch it up when you put a patch around your ball, make it a tight fit. That was very difficult to do. These things were the first real actual practical uses of firearms, and they were very obsolete by the time we get into the buccaneering age. Now, the next sort of gun that you'll see is the matchlock, and that's used by the Spanish. And it is also a ancient, kind of out-of-date weapon by the, when we look at the uh, 17th century. The matchlock is called that because of the, fire, the firelock mechanism holds a lit match behind it. That's what slams forward on the with the hammer to ignite the charge. They're why a lot of the models that you'll see, they'll have a uh, long cord of something. That's the lit match that they have to carry around. I actually cut a lot of those off, thinking that they were flashing. So I have a bunch of my Milicianos that just are have their hand that's just not holding anything. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell Joseph. You'll say that he, they can't reload their musket. With the matchlock and the Africus, a lot of them required a bipod to steady the firing of the weapon because they were so heavy. Fun little Dan fact here. The Russians pre this, pre this era, actually right around this era, around 50, no, 1500s, 1500s would actually use their Bardish battle axes as a stand for their matchlock so they could fire that musket and then if they were being charged instead of having a wimpy little stand they had a giant battle axe to fight the enemy off with which i thought was really cool and needed a plug in here and that brings us into the buccaneer guns what makes them so special guy well buccaneer guns are 
flintlock muskets. The only thing that makes them different than flintlock muskets, which flintlock muskets are new technology of the time. They started being developed around the early 17th century. And the buccaneer gun specifically is just a long flintlock musket imported to the Americas as uh, hunting muskets. They considered them hunting muskets because they were so long. They found out that long barrels increase the accuracy of the shot. So they'd been experimenting with that for a long time, but the buccaneer guns or the hunting muskets were not considered war weapons because they were a lot harder to load because they were so long and they were so heavy that to hold up that you really had to have a lot of upper body strength to be able to level it. That sounds like the rifles that were used in the American Revolution. The units that have a buccaneer gun are usually some of the better shots in the game. And the reason why that is, why they were so accurate, because again, we're talking basically flintlock smoothbore, it has to do with the actual loading of the weapon. So for those who don't know, when you load a flintlock, you put really fine priming powder in the pan, you close the frizzen, and then bring the lock back to half cock. When you pour your powder down the barrel, you pour, it's usually about modern day, 60 50, 55, 60 grains. I wasn't able to find anything for an accurate load of the day, but 60 grains is considered standard today, which is the actual measure of powder. And then when you put the ball in, you can't just put the ball down next to the powder. Because if there's an airspace between powder and ball, your musket becomes a grenade in your hands, and nobody's a fan of that. So you need to put <laughs> something to kind of seal that powder back. What these buccaneers would do is use a patch cloth that would make the actual musket ball fit very tight in the barrels. While it was a little bit harder to ram down, it fits so tight that it would go out in essentially one direction. Because if you use a really loose patch, your ball is going to bounce down the barrel and fly out whatever way it happened to bounce before it exited. So on top of being very proficient because they were pig hunters and were loading and using their weapons every day, they also figured out that if you really pack that ball in with a nice tight patch, you get the best possible accuracy out of that weapon. And that was a, a tradition that was only born by repeated use and experimentation. Yes, this is exactly why we see lots of records, and especially for those who listen to the Pirate History podcast, where Spanish militia members or most militia members throughout the Caribbean only fired their weapons a couple times a year in drills, whereas the buccaneers were using them essentially every single day. So they were better at loading, better at firing, they knew their weapons very well, and they kept their weapons clean, oiled, and ready to go, which is not something most of the militias did with the higher tier militias like some of the dutch and english they often kept their weapons pretty clean but especially in the spanish colonies weapons were almost were obsolete and rusted and all kinds of awfulness that made them almost unserviceable and now as far as the practical stuff goes all smoothbore muskets are effective usually out to 50 yards but that's like the max of their range even with the tight even with a tight ball obviously the ball will keep going beyond that but getting a well-aimed shot is extremely difficult as someone who's fired flintlock smoothbore before even with a really tight ball i'm not that good a shot and it's really really difficult whereas i can drill that with a modern rifle all day long 50, 25 50 yards so it is a bit sketch but like we said these guys really knew their weapon even the best shot historically with a smoothbore musket would only hit half the time yeah Assuming it goes off, because we also have things that are prone to misfire, not having enough powder in the pan, or powder gets wet. There's lots of things that can go wrong with muskets of this type. But if you were using a firelock or a flintlock, predominantly a flintlock, you are at an advantage over your arquebus or matchlock wielding opponent because you can fire your gun at night without revealing your position a whole bunch because you don't have a lit match. And if it rains, the, the actual addition system for a match lock requires that you open the pan before lowering the match in, which means there's a longer time for your powder to get exposed to rain. The flintlock powder is only ever exposed as the flint slides down the frizz and, and puts the sparks in there. It's a much less of ignition time than the match lock does. So you can use it in the rain, it's just not ideal. If you're using a flintlock musket at the time, it's a lot more likely that it's a newer weapon than a matchlock that might have been in a storehouse for uh like to a century now we've talked about the muskets we've talked about you know the mechanical accuracy man accuracy what are some good historical uses we've seen that could translate over into the actual game guy if you found out the max range of your opponent's arms 
and yours was more, you could stay outside of their maximum range and shoot them. That's hilarious. I love that. One of my favorite things to do that translates over from history and popular culture into the actual game of Blood and Plunder is targeting the helmsman. For those of you who've seen Black Sails, you probably remember that part in season one when they're when Captain Flint is chasing the Andromache and he has Mr. Beau Cleric up in the up in the crow's nest and he's using his musket, typically buccaneer guns, I believe, to snipe the helmsman so they the ship cannot get back in the wind and sail away. You can do this in Blood and Plunder by targeting the models on the back with your musket units. Because a lot of the ships if you take out all the guys on the back deck, they cannot turn effectively, which means you now have superior mobility. You can use the same, the same strategy to go after the gun crew. If you concentrate your musket fire on the gun crew, then the guns can't fire as well. Yeah, it's really hard to fire and load a gun when you're being shot at and you're scared. Another thing on land, use the, the muskets to try sniping any sort of officer or command that the opponent has. So you saw through history, a lot of commanders would take a bullet in the first couple minutes of the, uh, of the conflict. And, you know, it might've been just a stray bullet. It might've been an accident, but it sounds from a, from a realistic st standpoint or a modern day standpoint, taking away your, your opponent's command structure is really useful because those are the people that are, are other people are trained to follow. And that works in Blood and Plunder by focusing your, your shots on the command unit. Because if you can panic the command unit, if you can get them shaken, if you can get them prone, then they're going to be less effective. That is an excellent point. Another good strategy you can use, if you have units that have the fast reload special rule, you can use your superior volume of fire to reload faster than your opponent and just continue to put the hurt on. Pick a unit you want to get rid of and just focus fire on that unit. Because I believe it's the Freebooters, the Buccaneers. Do Fulabestiers have fast reload as well? Yes, they do. So all the units that typically have Buccaneer guns will usually also have fast reload. They will outclass their militia units as far as volume of fire goes, typically. A additional historical way that the slow reload of a musket was compensated would be uh, what they called volley firing. When they would have a line of musketeers would fire, and then there would be a line directly behind them that had loaded muskets, and the ones that uh, had just fired would step back and start reloading while the fresh ones in the back would step forward and fire. Now in Blood and Plunder, we call this half firing. And it's where you would have half of a unit fire their muskets and round it, uh, round it down. And instead of getting two reload markers, you would only get one. And half loading is, is the most useful in Blood and Plunder on units that, just like historically, were bad at loading uh or in this case in blood and plunder it's bad at shooting i'm talking about most militia units that are uh, inexperienced and other units that do not have a uh, fast reload half firing can make it so the unit is able to still have a presence on the battlefield without taking so many turns to get of uh, their firearm reloaded i think that about covers all of our historical analysis and relating the historical data of muskets to the actual blood and plunder game yeah that about does all of the historical facts and and blood and plunder stuff that we have for the musket for a full review of all of the factions and units that have that use muskets that we've written so far as well as all the other nationalities and a bunch of other Blood and Plunder stuff, go to bloodandpigment.com and check out the articles we have there. We got articles on, net, on ships, nations, factions, terrain building, painting guides, and battle reports. Go check it out! This has been the first installment of Tools of the Trade. Keep your dice ready and the wind at your back. Yarhar!